kids like to, do we have kids? How many kids we got? We got kids? We got kids! We got kids, everybody! Yay!
No matter what you can do or what you can't do. No matter what questions you ask, you'll hold on to that wonder. Sometimes us grown-ups, we have pretty much been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. We get fried out, we get cynical, we get grouchy. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've seen adults do that. Yeah, I'm sure. No, no, no names now, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be, it'll be, you'll hear it in the children's sermon. <laughs> but um, you know what? Keep, keep that amazement and that wonder. See, sometimes us adults, we think we've seen it all and we know it all. Stay there in that place where you want to keep learning and growing and being surprised and being in awe of God. That's a good lesson for all of us. Thank you so much for coming up. Will you keep coming up? Good. All right. You have a good day, okay? We'll have treats in another day. <coughs> Aren't they wonderful, everybody? The greatness of the kingdom. They're not just our future, they're our present, right? And they really are our present. They're a gift to us all. They're a gift to our worship. You know, when God... Uh, gives them his Holy Spirit, he doesn't give them a junior Holy Spirit. How many of you knew that? He gives them a real thing, real deal. Well, I have to tell you, I, it, it's, I've been waiting a long time to introduce some wonderful folks to you. And um, I, I've known <clears throat> President Cornyn now, I guess, what about 13 plus years. I think. And um, the AFLC is a, a group that shares much in common with the Lutheran congregations in Mission for Christ. And they share a common heart for God's Word as the inerrant and fallible Word of God. And along with that, a great commitment to uh, uh, not only the Word, but the things of the Word, which is one of those things being what we're celebrating this weekend, which is marriage, the marriage of one man and one woman, as God indicates in his word. And along with that, family. And along with that, we share networking, the value of being in network and being connection at congregations and connection with each other, as well as that, that it's not by denomination, in other words, a stratified structure but rather through a connection with other churches that, are, that have that together. Now the AFLC has some wonderful, um, some wonderful resources in many different areas, including evangelism, and, um, and a heart for breaking, uh, of reaching the broken and the hurting and the lost. Would you please welcome uh, Pastor Lyndon Cornyn, President of the AFLC, is going to come and share it a little tough time. Thank you, Pastor Dave. It is a privilege to be here with you from Minnesota, <laughs> where on Thursday we had flurries just this last Thursday, so I'll be thankful where you are in Virginia. Yeah, I know, you're not jealous. <laughs> Pastor Dave mentioned with the children that uh, one of the things he loves about children is that they ask questions. And uh, when it comes to sharing our faith with people, there's a couple of questions that D. James Kennedy came up with that used with Evangelism Explosion. And I like to use those questions because they've been helpful. They're called the diagnostic questions. When you go to the doctor, he sometimes asks you, are you hurting? Where? These questions have been helpful to me. The first one is, have you come to the place in your own spiritual life where if you were to die tonight that you'd know for certain that you'd go to heaven? Think about that in your own life. Do you know that for sure? Second question, suppose you were to die and you'd stand before God and he would say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to him? That first question some people answer, well, I think so or I hope so. Second question, sometimes people answer, well, I'm trying to do the best I can. Hope I've been good enough. 
And according to the Bible, that doesn't quite cut it. We have to be holy to enter into the presence of God. I'm thankful for what 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 13, I love to share these verses. And this is the testimony, or this is the record. You believe this is God's testimony and God's record of who He is? That's been gifted to us inherently. We can trust Him. This is the record that God has given us eternal life. When I was in school, I hated grammar. Any children hate grammar and English? I couldn't see any purpose in it. But when I started studying God's Word, all of a sudden I saw purpose to it. <coughs> has given is past tense, isn't it? That's right. It's something He has done in the past. It's not something I'm presently working at. And you know what? The people around us need to know that. Salvation isn't something we're working at. It's been something that has been given like a gift under the Christmas tree that Pastor Dave was talking about that excites us. A gift with your name on it. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And then it says, this life is in His Son. Not in what we do, it's in Jesus. That's where eternal life is. It's not in what you're trying to do. And people around you need to know that. And then verse 12 tells us that it's not going to be a mysterious thing on Judgment Day. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It all comes down to whether we have Jesus or not. That's that simple. And then verse 13 says, These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that, that's the purpose, that you may hope you have eternal life, that you may think you have eternal life, that you may know. K-N-O-W. Now, do you know if you're married or not? You ought to know that. <laughs> it's one or the other, right? You made a commitment before God. You made vows. That made you married. That you may know that you have eternal life. So we are able to know if we are Christians. If we're going to heaven. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again for us. My sins were brought to Him and I'm trusting in Him. What a joy to be able to know that. I want to close with a story that I was reading about the history of uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, it's about a mile span, 1933 to 1937. They constructed it. When they started working on that, they were losing about one man per million dollars spent on that bridge. Dangerous place to work. About halfway through the project, they discovered they uh, made the decision to install the greatest safety net that had ever been erected in the world. A net something like they use in the circus, but long. That net, when it was put up, saved 19 men from death. That was one result. There were two results of putting that net up. 19 men were spared from death, and they formed a club. And you know what the name of that club was? The Halfway to Hell Club. That's what they called it. Because back in that day, they recognized their own sinfulness. Today, our culture has made that change that they think everybody's going to heaven. But that's not true according to what the Bible says, because we're all sinful. We go to heaven if we have a Savior from our sin. That's the only way we get into heaven. The second result, though, of that safety net was the work was finished nine months ahead of time. Why was that? Because all of a sudden, the workers were freed from the fear of dying. They could give themselves to the work. And you know what? That's what Christ has done for us. He's taken the sting out of death. He took the punishment. So we don't have to live in fearfulness of death. And we are free to live and to serve and to minister to people. And that's a great way to be able to do evangelism in your community. It's a joy to be with you. Thank you, Pastor. We haven't been together since Pennsylvania. No. And uh, it's nice to continue a wonderful, not only collegial relationship, but a, a relationship connected at the heart as well. And at the heart and being brothers in Christ Amen. extends far above many other things. And uh, 
So I wanted to share a little bit with you. We continue this wonderful series, and I, again, I can't say thank you enough to Jody for our hard work, for... Uh, For all the, all the work in, in pulling together the PowerPoints and all that you've done in, in that. She's truly a gift. Absolutely. And we're going to continue talking today about being part of the family. Part of the family. And building the church. How do we get it to do that more? A little less wax now. Thanks. So anyway... Um, anyway, the, what I want to do was uh, share with you some scriptures um, as we're talking about building the church God's way, that the church is a family, and I, I wanted to share a little family story with you. It was the day before Thanksgiving, and an elderly man in Phoenix called up his son in New York and says, I hate to ruin your day, but I have to tell you that your mother and I are divorcing. Forty-five years of misery is enough. Pop, what are you talking about? The son screams. Well, we can't stand the sight of each other any longer, the old man says. We're sick of each other, and I'm sick of talking about this. So call your sister in Chicago and tell her. And so he hangs up and frantic. The son calls his sister, who explodes on the phone. Like thunder, they're getting divorced. She shouts, I'll take care of this. So she calls Phoenix immediately and screams at the old man, You are not getting divorced. Don't do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling my brother back, and we'll be there at our own expense tomorrow. Until then, don't do a thing. Do you hear me? She hangs up. The old man smiles and hangs up his phone and turns to his wife and says, Okay, they're coming for Thanksgiving. <laughs> now what do we tell them to get them to come for Christmas? <laughs> and they're paying their own way. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. When we talk about the church's family, we can go to God's Word. And uh, this passage here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above approach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well, and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain, they must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect. Worthy of what? Yes. Very good. Not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. In how much? Okay. Yeah. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Come now, Lord, let your word, which is alive and living, find its way into our hearts and our minds. Lead us as we explore building the church God's way, being part of the family. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, that's quite a list of things for an overseer. 
to, to have. And uh, as that passage at the first service was being read, and all these requirements were read as part of the first lesson, I leaned over to Bonnie for a second, who's assistant minister, and I said, well, I guess 9 out of 10 ain't bad. <laughs> Thinking of myself. Well, because the church is a family, that should affect how we're organized too. Is your family organized differently than the business that you work at? I'm sure it is, right? First Peter 3 8 has these wonderful words. You should be like one big happy family, full of sympathy toward each other, loving one another with tender hearts and humble minds. Isn't that a great word? And I think that speaks so well of our congregation. And we fulfill that one good, don't you think? We are one big happy family, and I'll put the emphasis on big and family. And I also have to put an emphasis on healthy as well, because I think that's, that's another key important thing, is to have healthy families as well. So because we're a family, we operate on the basis of relationships, not rules. Did you get that? Relationships, not rules. See, when Arden and I got married 21 years ago, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. When we got married, we got married for better or for worse. I couldn't have done better in getting hurt, and she couldn't have done worse in getting me. <laughs> but you see, we had all these rules in our marriage. Maybe you had some too, like the ways that we folded the towels. And uh, you pushed the toothpaste from the bottom up and not from the middle. Do you remember some of those rules? Did you, Mary, did you guys have any of those? Ours was vacuuming, yes. Yeah? <laughs> but we had a rule about, you know, how to load the TP and everything else, you know. But now after being married all these years... We don't have any of those rules anymore. Maybe she's just giving up on me. <laughs> but we don't need those rules anymore. Because she has me trained. I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> Why? Well, see, because the only rule we, we have is to always tell the truth. I always say to my kids and my family, I'd much rather hear bad truth than a good lie. Anytime. I'd much rather know where somebody really is rather than putting on that plastic face and glossing over. And I want that for our congregation because, see, we're a family here as well. So that one, always tell the truth. Because, you see, the greater the relationship, the fewer rules you need. need. You just don't need them. The stronger the relationship, you, know, you, you just trust people. And that's one of the things that, that I value so much about apostles. Is that we're a family and we're growing in our faith. We're growing in our trust of each other. Do we ever mess up? Absolutely. But you know what? We're growing in our trust. So I talked to, you know, I, I, I've kicked it around and I'm thinking about creating a policy manual that's about two pages long. And uh, the first page is going to say, every staff member, every member of this congregation in this church will use his or her best judgment in every situation. How do you like that? That's rule number one. And then you turn the page, and it says rule number two. There are no other rules. You see, that's, that's our policy manual. It needs to be a policy manual because we trust each other in this family, in this congregation. Do pe does that mean people never make mistakes? No. Sure they do, right? But I don't want to be the one who makes all the mistakes myself. Because even pastors goof stuff up once in a, once in a while. Yeah, the last week we were consecrating. I was consecrating the elements for Holy Communion. I pick up the chalice and say something about, this is my body which is broken for you. 
Congregation, you were so sweet. You just looked at me and go, uh-huh. <laughs> okay, don't worry about it. Pastor's losing it, isn't he? <laughs> That's okay. You see, I don't want to be the only one making any of the goof-ups. And you know what? What goes on here, do you see, this is the real deal. This worship stuff, these folks, as wonderful as they are, they're not here performing for you. This isn't a performance, is it, Kelly? This is not a performance. This is about entertaining his presence. So they're not up here entertaining rotten human stinking flesh. What they're about is entertaining the presence of the Almighty God when we come together to worship. And so if there are goof-ups or whatever, you know, there was a time, there was a time when they were consecrating Solomon's temple where the worshipers couldn't even worship. The, the worship leaders were falling up or they couldn't, even the priests were trying to offer sacrifices. They couldn't keep doing what they were doing. Why? Because God's presence was there and it was about him showing up and doing something. How many of you are blessed this, well, that, with that word about God renewing anointing and replenishing your oil in relationships and, and work and things like that? Good number of thumbs. That's cool. See, in that kind of context, that's, that's likely to happen, where there's a freedom without being afraid of, oh my gosh, I might mess up. I might mess up this performance. See, that's not how it works. It may work like that elsewhere, but this is a place that's unlike other places. So we act like a family. And in a family, you don't have a rule book for your family. And if you think the Bible is a rule book, well, I guess you can see it that way, but I, I like to look at it as a love letter. I like to look at it as God's instruction manual for us. But you don't have a policy manual for your family because you operate on the basis of relationships. So how do we relate? We relate like a family. 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2. Philip's translation puts it this way. Don't reprimand a senior member of the church. Appeal to him as a father. Treat the young men as brothers and the older women as mothers. Treat the younger women as sisters. If churches would just simply follow that little verse, they'd have so few problems. The Bible says that we're to treat each other like family. Don't you get that? Treat each other like, like we're in relationship with each other. A friend of mine has a saying that I really value. He said, he said um, even when my brother treats me like an enemy, my brother is not my enemy. My brother is still my brother. Does that make sense? Yeah. See, we're to treat, treat, the scripture says that we're to treat those who have been Christians longer than us as spiritual fathers and mothers and treat those who are about the same age as us as spiritual brothers and sisters. Because we're a family. I know you want to break out. I, I know somebody here wants to break out. I know you're going to break out with we are family. <laughs> Is that you, Robin? I know somebody's thinking about that. You're ready to go, girl. I'll tell you what right now. So we have all these relationships. And, uh, you know, I have men in this congregation that I highly respect their maturity in the faith. And I'm, I know I can go to them as a spiritual father. I, I can look to them and seek them out, seek their advice and their direction. And I can count on them that if I'm putting the head where the tail's supposed to be, that they, in, in kindness, will take me under the wing and say, hey, son, listen, you know, think about it this way. Have you been, you know, have you thought about this? Also, these folks who are mature, and that's another thing that the scripture is talking about, the value of maturity in the faith. Folks who have had some experience or are familiar with this, this family that we have at Apostles have more insight than the guy who's just new on board. I'll tell you what, that's a word for a lot of good young pastors and new, new pastors stepping into the pastorate. 
So, like I said, I have these spiritual fathers. I also have lots of spiritual brothers. I have many of them. And, and, and probably all you guys I consider part of my spiritual brothers. And I know I can go to you. And I can draw on your strength. We're a band of brothers, right? And we, we know we've got each other's back. And if there's something going on in each other's lives, we know we're there looking after each other. If we're in temptation or something, we know we can go to each other and go to the Lord. I'm always listening. I value your, your judgment as spiritual brothers in the Lord. And I have many spiritual sisters in this church. And I invite, you know, sometimes I get advice from them. Okay? Men need to see uh, things at times from a woman's perspective. There are times I might ask my wife about something, or I might ask one of you other ladies about something. I get advice, and they, they never hesitate to give me advice <laughs> or give me directions and make me know that I'm, you know, make me happy to know that I'm on my way, right? But uh, the only problem is I don't have too many spiritual mothers in this church. And I, I, because I haven't met too many women who want to admit being older women. <laughs> so I just consider you all my spiritual sisters. And I don't have many spiritual mothers yet, but I'm sure they're out there. So do you vote in your family? Well, we, we don't really do a lot of voting in my family. See, because if we voted in our family, we'd have ice cream for breakfast. <laughs> We we play we or we play on PS4 all day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Daniel's ready. Amen, brother. Preach it. <laughs> we'd never have school. We never do any homework. We take vacations every other week. Yeah. See, in my family, the mature are in the minority. We've got two parents and four kids, and they're growing and maturing on their own. That's a wonderful thing to see. But there's something of value to be said for growing in maturity in our Christian faith together. So, that, so you know, I, I think there's a lot of value in that. The Bible says we are to value those who have been Christians longer than us and who are spiritually mature. Isn't that nice to know that, you know, we can go to one another and we can seek out direction as we're seeking God's word as well. So how do you know who the spiritually mature folks are in the church? And it's simple. Just simply look at their character. Look at their character. Isn't this passage? It's about character and looking at a person's character. First Timothy, First Timothy 3, 4 to 5. Look at the character that's required of a pastor. A pastor must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his family, how can he take care of God's church? It's interesting that it says the pastor is to manage the church like a father. And a husband is to manage the, the family. Why is that? Well, it's because an unmanaged family is an unloved family. It's an unloved family. It's out of love, dads, men, that we shepherd and we care for our family. Scripture even talks about that, that the ones that the Lord loves, he disciplines, he guides, and he directs, and he builds up. An unmanaged church is an unloved church. It says a pastor must manage the church like fathers manage the home. And one of the qualifications for being a pastor says he has to have a strong family life. Thanks, no pressure there. <laughs> but why is that? Not once in the scripture does it say that the pastor has to have a degree in business. And I have a long, extensive background in business. Right? It doesn't say a single time that a pastor has to have a working knowledge of Greek and Hebrew. But I've had some Greek and Hebrew. 
Does it say that you have, as a pastor, that you have to have a, a master's or a doctorate degree? And I have degrees too. Not once does it say that you have to be a success in any of these areas, but it does say that you have to have a strong family life. Isn't that interesting? A strong family life. Does that mean that we have a perfect family, that we never make any mistakes? Maybe you've heard me say it before. We put the fun in dysfunctional. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> well, we've got our own variation on a tune at my house. You must have the skills to manage a family well because the church is a family, period. That's it. End of story. It's not a business. You try to operate a church like a business. Yeah, there's business aspects. There's, there's work to be done. But the church is a family, first and foremost. It's an organism, not an organization. Right? It's a living, breathing thing. The same skills that I am to use with my family as husband and father, I am to use to lead and, and be a pastor of this church. So, you want to know me? How do I manage my family? Ask them. Am I a dictator? This is where I get a little nervous. <laughs> Blow a whistle and everybody comes a-running. Command them and tell them how it's going to be. No. She wouldn't let me get away with it anyway. The Bible says that the husband is to be the spiritual leader of his home by laying down his life for his wife and, ch and children. Ephesians 5.25. Pay attention to this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So I've got to tell you, a woman whose husband sets that as a precedent and never has need to fear the three big A's, which is abuse, abandonment, or adultery. And can I take a minute, just a second, to tell you that the enemy would love to get us to believe the lie that God cannot heal an abusive relationship. But you don't need to stay in that relationship being abused. The same with, with abandonment or adultery. I have seen God, Pastor, you've seen God heal and retrieve marriages from, from the edge of death. And even when they were so dead. I mean, do we are is this a church that believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yes. yes. Then how dare we say that there is something that cannot be forgiven, that can, yeah. If there is brokenness, yeah, things may not be as they were before. But don't we serve a risen Savior? Don't we serve a God who can take a dead marriage and raise it to life? Amen. I, I really believe so. It says, just as Christ laid down his life for the church, that I am to give my life for my wife and my children. Hey, Bubba, you got it going on. You're pulling down 250K. You got a great 401. Huh? You're bright. You got your PhD in all kinds of fields. That's a great thing. Does your wife know that you love Jesus? Does she sense you as a spiritual force in the family? See, a woman who looks at that is never and, and sees a man who is on fire for God never has any worries. Am I going to be abused? Am I going to be stepped on? And that's the kind of guy that a woman seeks out. A man after God's own heart. That's a man who treasures his wife and lays his life down for his, his family every single day, even when it's not comfortable. Whether, whatever you're doing, blue collar, white collar, punching a clock, I don't care what you're doing. 
You're living your spirituality, guys. You get it? So, and some ladies, sometimes we judge our guys' spirituality based on how much they're holding the Bible and how many prayers they're praying. But you know what? Masculine spirituality may not always be like that and look like we want it to look like. You know? This thing that God is calling guys to, calling families to, is a very holy and very, very precious thing. Sorry, I got to preach in there. Occupational hazard. <laughs> Christ laid down his life for the church by setting in his example. And that's what it means to be a leader. All right? I didn't come here to just make followers for Jesus. I came here to make leaders for Jesus. You get the difference? And I'm here to serve and to set an example. And that's how I lead my family. And I know there's, there's guys in this church that, that believe that as well. That's a great joy. So we're going to continue to plow through this and keep working on the church as a family. Right? This is a blessing. It's wonderful to see God, God doing stuff among us and just keep being open to it. Please rise, Lord, to bless you and pray for you. <coughs> Thank you, Lord, for the time we had of anointing. The Lord, where the oil has, has run dry, or dripped out, continue to refill. And Lord, where there's leaks, come along and plug those leaks. Lord, you, there is forgiveness for the harsh words that we speak to one another. Forgive us for those times when we partner with bitterness or brokenness or whatever it is that we're partnering with that's not of you. Thank you that you show us how to forgive. You model that. And you model in your own life what it is to lay down our lives in the care and the service of others. We pray this through Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord is with you all. Let's share the peace of the Lord. Thank you.